So my name is Umesh. Uh, I am from Intel, and there is the rest of the team who contributed to this specific use case. Okay. I am an engineering manager for uh, the specific product that we developed. It's called as Age Controls for Industrial. And the feature that I am talking today is kind of one of the kind of a key feature that we are delivering for most of our uh, China customers. This is coming, the use case is coming from China. So ECI stands for Age Controls for uh, Industrial. Uh, the credit is, credit goes to most of the developers that you see at the down. They are from China and they couldn't travel. So I am here to present on the behalf of them. Hopefully, I'll do the justice to what these guys have developed. So, I'll talk about uh, what ECI is, Edge Controls for Industrial, and how are we basically uh, working on the real-time aspects. Uh, we use extensively the preamp targeting, and most of the time we focus on our uh, optimizations, benchmarking. That's what I think uh, is needed in the market when it go when we go to the customer. Everyone knows there is a preamp target available, there is a general uh, purpose kernel available, but what they, what they are looking for is for their specific use case, they want to understand that that system has been optimized. So we heavily focus on the optimizations and we do deliver the, uh, the kernel image, the whole image if someone wants to basically use. We do deliver the source. Again, it's more open than open source. The source is available. Anyone can download from eci.intel.com. Okay. So what this product is, uh, the way I said, uh, most of the industrial customers today, what we have is uh, kind of they, they have that fragmented uh, kind of OS. They, they do use Linux, uh, but there is no standardized way for the industrial customer. Today's my focus is mostly the industrial customers, uh, mostly the discrete automation, process automation, you got the robotics customer. So that's where this uh, product is kind of focused on. So the whole idea of uh, the ECI is making sure that we are making the easy consumption of uh, real-time aspects, make sure that we give them the uh, modular modularity. So when, when I talk about modularity, what does that mean? So take an example of uh, process automation. They might not be strict on a real-time cycle time. Their, their cycle time requirement might be in a seconds versus when you go to the discrete automation or robotics, their cycle time uh, are more strict. So you need maybe in a microsecond or millisecond requirements, correct? So even though they are using the same software, their KPI requirements are a little bit different. So that's where we basically bring in uh, multiple models, modules in, inside the kernel itself and multiple kernel, kernel configurations that you can optimize, you enable something, disable something. So that's where we talk about the modularity. And uh, in addition to the kernel, there are other features or aspects of uh, the software that we deliver is making sure that we work closely for the virtualization. Now, workload consolidation has become like a big theme and software defined industrial system is another theme. So in an industrial domain, what you see uh, today is mostly uh, you have like a fixed function devices. Like on a factory floor, you will find that there are 10 devices doing 10 independent jobs. Now, the, the, the push is they want to consolidate. You don't want to use uh, like a different hardware for different things, correct? So the biggest thing that we want to solve is on the consolidation. So that's where the virtualization comes into picture, containerization, and uh, finally uh, the the way of deploying it itself, correct? So take an example of a factory floor. Now, if you want to bring a new IPC industrial PC onto the factory floor, now there is a life cycle. There is a day, day zero life cycle of that device. What what it has to happen, correct? When you connect to the factory floor, so that's where we call like onboarding of a device. So we, we do provide the technologies like the uh, FIDO, I don't know if you guys heard about that, that is used for the, uh, the onboarding technology. So that's your zero touch onboarding. So overall, this is what kind of included inside the edge controls. So I briefly touched on the kind of technologies uh, that we uh, work on. Uh, for the virtualization, I can just, because that's a topic I'll be talking more. So in virtualization, we deal uh, extensively with the hypervisors. So you know KVM is type 2 hypervisor, but for the real-time use cases, we need to have a type 1 hypervisor. So we go for uh, uh, ACON, I don't know if you heard about that, ACRN. So it's again an open source project initiated by Intel, but now it is the community project. It is part of Linux Foundation. So we use ACON extensively for the type 1 hypervisor. So that's where the virtualization technology lies. We do support the third party, but mostly our intention is to support the open source one. Uh, orchestration, um, 
th this is basically where you are bringing the IT into OT kind of thing, correct? So, uh, today the way I said, there are fixed function devices, they do a one specific job. With the orchestration technology, we want to bring in like uh, dynamic workload, uh, basically application management. The role of that PC can be changed by deploying the workload that you want to have. Let's take an example of robotic arm today. It might be doing a job of uh, pick and place from conveyor 1 to conveyor belt 2, okay? And at the same time, it is detecting a specific object, maybe it is doing a sorting. Now, by using the same conveyor belt and same robotic arm, but now you deploy the another workload and now ask that robotic arm to do something different. So, what is happening here is we are trying to use the same hardware setup, but the different application. So, that's where we want to basically bring in the orchestration technology, making sure that you can deploy those workload. We do deal with most of the OSS, making sure that uh, we update, uh, we, we, we rely more on to the uh, community, mostly the LTS kernel is what we take and then uh, the additional patches that we put on the top of that. We do deliver those patches. Uh, intention is always to upstream whatever the changes we do, uh, but some most of the time if they are out of tree, then we do give those codes with our releases. Uh, we extensively work on the connectivity. Uh, TSN is kind of the big thing, uh, time sensitive network. If you see in industry, most of the protocols are proprietary. Uh, Profinet, Profibus, uh, if you see Siemens have their own protocol. So what we want is we want to bring in more openness. So TSN is what the big push is there going from Intel. You will find most of the uh, like uh, the Ethernet controller like I210, I225, I226, these are uh, supported on uh, discrete and integrated also. So we extensively work on that one. Uh, robotics is one of the profile of control, so we do support robotics, uh, security and functional safety. These are uh, functional safety, we don't do much on that one. Uh, security is, is more on like uh, Intel has inbuilt uh, TPM. Uh, what we do is on the base of that TPM, we have the another software layer uh, which can basically help you to run your workload uh, into like a trusted environment. Uh, you might remember Android has that TEE trusted edge execution environment. Similarly, let us say you have the uh, AI workload. Now, you want to protect that AI workload. So, you might want to run that in a trusted execution environment. So, that is where we spend some time making sure that we deliver that kind of solution. And these are the kind of verticals uh, businesses that we support, miss uh, machine builder, discrete automation, process automation and industrial robotics. That is kind of the high level overview of what the product itself is. Now, I am going to talk about the, the use case that I am trying to present here. So, workload consolidation is the key. Uh, what our customer wants is they want to get more out of the, uh, the power that we have in the CPU. Let us say there is a 8 core CPU. Uh, traditionally, what happens is you might be running let us say on the uh, Ubuntu or maybe Windows. So, you do not know whether you are taking, you, you, utilizing all those cores effectively or not, correct? So, that is where we bring in like virtualization technologies. So, traditionally for the RT workload, what you do is you use two cores. Your one core is utilized for your RT task and historically these RT tasks are uh, not big. They are maybe the relays uh, or uh, like a small task, but you want to make sure that you do not have any jitter for that task. And then you run most of your house housekeeping task on the core, other core. So, this is the historic one. <coughs> Now, what we are trying to do is, how can we squeeze in uh, both these tasks on the one core? Uh, the way I said, there are, let's say there is 8 core uh, CPU, you want to basically run the uh, maybe service OS on one core and the rest of the 7 core, you want to simulate the RT task. And in that case, now you are combining both the housekeeping task and the RT task onto the one core. So, this was the problem statement. Um, the use case was from the, uh, we had like a, uh, energy customers, uh, the use case was to have those 8 or 7 VMs running with the RT task. So, this is kind of the high level, uh, I would say architecture to enable that 8 core, uh, what we used is we used the uh, hypervisor, mostly the Acon hypervisor. It helps you to isolate. Uh, the reason behind using uh, Acon versus uh, we have other like let us say KVM which is type 2 hypervisor, you will not be able to do much of the isolation compared to your type 1 hypervisor. So, we used uh, type 1 hypervisor making sure that we isolate the resources. So, you are actually what you are doing is you are pinning the task, yeah, that task to a specific core. 
So we do a CPU pinning for those tasks and then uh, and then uh, some pass through activities maybe you want to uh, use let us say uh, for your uh, service OS you want to use the graphics. So you can use some uh, graphics pass through or you can have the shared graphics also. So based on your use case you can do that but the whole idea is we do the isolation so that way you are trying to avoid the noisy neighbors uh, from that RT task. So this is kind of architecture. This, this is one architecture and then based on this, this was the use case. We had this uh, distributed controller system. If you see here, uh, we got seven RT VMs and uh, we got one service VM. So on that eight core system, we have uh, seven uh, RT task running and the way I said, they are very lightweighted. Uh, I might be having relay or watchdog or some other things, correct? And then the uh, one core we are trying to use for the uh, service OS. So when you have the hypervisor like uh, Econ, you need to have uh, the uh, the task running, the service OS task running on the one core. So we actually have this one here, and then uh, most of those tasks uh, are running are, are pinned. This this VMs are pinned to the specific core. So this is like use case one. Uh, the use case two is where uh, most of our customer have kind of a mix mix critical workload. They want to run the RT task. At the same time, they want to run the non-RT task. So in this use case, uh, I have the RT task here running on the left side, but at the same time, uh, we have we have basically non-RT task. So if historically, if you see on the factory floor, you will find that there is a separate IPC for the HMI, okay? And then there is a separate IPC uh, for running the critical task. So with this uh, consolidation, we are trying to basically bring the RT and non-RT tasks together. The first use case was more on how can I have more RT tasks running on a one core. In the second use case, we are trying to bring in how can I have RT and non-RT tasks running together side by side, okay? Again, because of the isolation, even though you have, I usually, usually treat them as a noisy neighbor because they are going to create uh, kind of a jitter, more jitter for the RT task, correct? So because of isolation, even though there is a jitter, that jitter from the right uh, right side is not going to impact the real-time task. So this is our kind of a use case too, uh, where uh, this is getting adopted because it saves definitely the cost. Uh, instead of having two or three PCs, now you can do the same task with uh, just one PC. All you need to do is get the core uh, machine with multi-core and then use the technology, virtualization technology. And uh, these are the big cases that we deliver from uh, the, the product that I explained to you, the ECI. So we deliver this off the shelf uh, like a uh, big cases which can run on a specific platform and then uh, the, the customer can basically extend that uh, to the choice of their platform, okay? Again, this has the hypervisor for sure, yeah. Which slide? Okay, just stop. Can you please go to the previous slide? This one? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm a little bit confused. Um, what are the benefits of all these, like, eight virtual machines or so? Why are we over-utilizing the VM? Like, why is this, like, eight virtual machines instead of, like, eight processes, for example? Eight processes, yeah. So, good question. Because of isolation. So, let's say you don't have the hypervisor. Okay, you go with the bare metal. When I say bare metal, that means you have only, let's say Ubuntu. And then you have, you can run eight containers. That's what your question is, correct? Because instead of using VMs, can I have uh, like just Ubuntu, maybe real time, and then run the containers? Is that what? Uh, but even without a hypervisor and with standard preempt RT Linux, mm -hmm. we can still have eight container C groups Agree? and then... Yeah prioritize them. So I'm just, yeah, this picture is just confusing me a little bit. I'm not saying it's strong or I'm just... Yeah, I'll explain uh, you that one. Yeah. So the question is good. So see, even we have those use cases. So so the use cases where your cycle time and the jitter are strict, let's say you have a jitter requirement of 20 microsecond. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the challenge with the one what you are saying, CPU pinning or the priority pinning, correct? You have the process and you can do the priority pinning for those. Mm -hmm. Let's say I have the eight processes, I am going to pin those, correct? Now what is happening here is you, miss, we have validated all those use cases. So the challenge with that is when you want to bring the system with the uh, jitter, miss, that defined jitter, most of the time with that mechanism, you will find more jitter. 
Now, what is happening in this case is, you know exactly what your task and how much CPU time it needs, correct? So, isolating each core, now, even though some, some noisy stuff is going on my core 1, that noisy, noisy thang, uh, stuff is not going to impact yes. something happening in a core 2. But you are saying more jitter even though there is a separate kernel on each core. So, I don't understand why there would be more jitter when there are a hypervisor and 8 pro no, no. and so are you? I thought you were asking eight me without cores. hypervisor. You have 8 cores Yeah. and each core has one hypervisor. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go on. No, no, hypervisor, hypervisor is, is hyper, hypervisor is, yeah. hy okay, I, so type 1 hypervisor and type 2 hypervisor. Everyone use KVM, I'm assuming, okay. Now, KVM is on the host OS. So, you have a host OS, Ubuntu, and then the KVM runs on the top of that, and then you span your VMs on the top of that. That's your type 2 hypervisor. In type 1 hypervisor, basically, it's not, there is no host OS. Each VM runs as if it is running on the bare metal hardware. So, the beauty of type 1 hypervisor is it slices the hardware, okay. Now, that is why I showed you this service VM. Now, what is happening is uh, for uh, all your uh, housekeeping task, it comes in your service VM and now you are literally slicing those resources with the type 1 hypervisor. So, as if you are running on an independent hardware. Mm -hmm. So, the requirement why we are doing this is because most of our customer have independent hardware, the way I said fixed function devices. The I factory see. has a fixed function devices. If I do not do this, they have the 10 devices doing that task. What mm -hmm. we are trying to do is bring this in a consolidated way, but give the same experience that they have before bringing on this one, whatever their workload was. So, maybe the, I think the, the clarity is more on the type 1 hypervisor. So, type 1 hypervisor will work a little different. Type 2 hypervisor is what you are uh, thinking. So, type 1 slices literally. So, you, this guy will feel as if it is running on independent hardware. It gets his dedicated resource. Well, um, one quick question. Yeah. Um, you have core 1, core 2 and so on. And what you do regarding caches? You partition them automatically with Arcan or how does so it work? So, we, we have, Miss, I think you are touching the, the, the point which is very critical. You are talking about the cache, correct? Yes, because if core 1 and core 2 share the same cache uh -huh. and the one uh, monopolizes at some point, then core 2 is um, the victim and in correct. increase. So, there is a, uh, not sure if you guys have heard about the cache allocation technology we call CAT. So, this is used by default? Which one, the cache? Uh, the CAT you just mentioned. Uh, you have you you can use PQ, PQOS uh, basically. So I, we are going more into deep for each process. So I can talk a little bit on that one. So you are right. If you don't allocate the cache for the each VM, then there is a challenge of eviction. But with the cache allocation technology, you can basically assign the cache to a specific core. Um, but who's doing the assignment? Is this Arkin on its own or? What is that? The, the allocation, who is performing it? Who is performing? So, the way, way we, we deliver here, so when we deliver the hypervisor configuration, so we basically ask the developer, let us say in a 4 VM, they want to run the time critical task, okay, where they want low jitter. That is where you want to make sure that it gets the cache and you do not expect the cache eviction, correct? That is where you use the PQOS, where you do, again, it is kind of pinning, making sure that my process, my, my core uh, basically the virtual machine 2 needs the cache. So, you can pin that cache. So, there is a, the way I said core pinning, same way you can do a cache pinning. Doing it. You're asking who's doing it, right? In the, in the software. You're doing it so kind of static, we, right? It's sort of a, a We preset. do a configuration. So, it's, it's kind of a drop. It's a, it's a configuration that we deliver via hypervisor. So, so it's a reference. So, when we give, deliver it to the end customer, so we give a reference saying that, okay, out of 7 VMs, maybe 2 VMs can do the cache pinning. Not everyone can do it. Cache is the limited one, correct? Okay, so, we deliver, the, we deliver them the configuration and based on their workload, they can decide where are they running their critical tasks. So, they need that cache pinning there. Okay, cool. Yeah, the cache allocation is, a, a, you know, and where that should be done and, and more dynamically is a good question. But I think the, going back to the other one, I think the, the question he asked over mm -hmm. there about the why you need the hypervisor, I think you're using a type 1 because it gives you additional isolation for apps that have not been developed for preempt RT or specially yeah. developed. I think, is this correct? If, if someone could, his, his, what he said is correct. Someone, if you develop the apps carefully yeah. for preempt RT, you mm -hmm. could do without a hypervisor, but the hypervisor gives you additional isolation and, and, yeah. and abstraction. 
um, and, and has some advantages there, right? So both are, both are correct, right? When I say, yeah, both, both of you are correct. But yeah, when yeah. I said why I'm saying uh, we need this, when you have a strict requirement for the jitter, you want to make sure that you have the cycle time of 20 microseconds versus maybe one millisecond. So that's where you want to make sure that you get the more isolation versus when you are talking about, let's say you have eight processes or eight containers running, you can still pin the cores. In the containers, containers can also be pinned to the specific core. So we are not against the container technology. That's why, but this was a very specific use case that our customer was asking. But we have another configuration where you can run without hypervisor, then you don't need hypervisor. You can bring in the RT and then you can pin your containers to the specific core. Okay. Both are valid. Good discussion. Okay, I think this was the second use case what I was telling. Uh, in addition to that, uh, independent RTs like multiple RTs and uh, uh, consolidating, it's we, we call more like a high density VMs. So you are basically squeezing more VMs on that core and utilizing all the eight cores. Another use case, the way I said, uh, like HMI. You, you, I have seen, I have visited multiple factories, so I have seen they still have traditional ways. Their HMI is running on a separate PC. They have RT workload running on a separate PC. So this is the use case where we are trying to do more like a workload consolidation is the one theme. And second is it has to be software defined. So when you bring in the hypervisor, that's where even you can deploy your VM dynamically. It's not like it has to be static, correct? That's where you bring the orchestration technologies, the way you are deploying the containers. Now you can even deploy the, the, the VMs. So as long as you have the support for the keyboard, let's say. So keyboard can help you to deploy in the VMs. As of now, we have very minimal support on the Acon for the VM orchestration, uh, but KVM supports fully. So you can even uh, orchestrate the VMs. So this, this basically helps you uh, on dynamically orchestrating your VMs. So this is the use case one. Again, can be extended. We have like CNC workload running here. So this is very specific RT workload. And then you have non-RT and HMI uh, running in the second one. Service OS, we have to keep one core uh, for a service OS. That's where your most of the housekeeping uh, task runs. We do have like a kind of pass-throughs uh, available for most of our uh, like IOs and all. That's where we use Vertio. I um, don't want to go much detail, but this is another architecture. This one is more on the configuration. So I want to show you like, okay, what was the configuration used for this use case? So uh, if you are interested, uh, maybe the Xeon D, uh, we call Ice Lake D internally. So that was the one what, what was used and most of the information is here. Uh, software side, <coughs> I think I, I spoke. One is the, we took stock standard uh, Ubuntu uh, as a service OS. We didn't patch that one. So the Ubuntu is used as a service OS. We just took uh, non-RT Ubuntu. Then we had the uh, Acon. Now, Acon needs a specific changes onto the kernel, so we have to apply the, uh, those are the out of three patches what I was mentioning. So Acon is, uh, the Acon patches are not yet upstream, so we still have to carry those. So Acon was used, and finally the specific kernel that we modified, because of the Acon and other use cases, we had to apply those patches. Uh, so that's, that's the combination, and what are the kernel configuration that we have used. All the details are there in the documentation. You guys can visit this website, eci.intel.com and then the kernel command line options that we are using. So this is kind of just a configuration that we use for the tuning. Now, the biggest challenge is once we have that one core assigned, uh, one RT assigned for one core, our job was to basically make sure that we are uh, optimizing that, correct? So we had, uh, what we did, uh, maybe you guys can give some suggestions here. We ran the stress NG uh, uh, just to simulate the uh, noisy, noisy neighbor. Uh, and then the iperf to generate the network traffic. So stress ng and network uh, iperf are more for the uh, kind of noise enabler simulating the task. Then we ran the ftrace and then the workload to simulate the workload we had the cyclic test. So we ran cyclic test to simulate the workload. Uh, stress ng and the iperf more for the network and the uh, noise enabler. And then uh, jitter is what we were focusing on. Okay, what is my max jitter? So as, as long as I'm hitting, miss, I'm within, within that bracket of the max jitter, then we are exiting. We are saying, okay, these are the configurations you can work. And if it is not, then we'll go back and again try tuning. So this is, again, the flow that we tried. The challenges that we observed when you have housekeeping and the real time running on the one core now. So remember what I showed you in the first one. So if you see, this is the traditional one. 
Now what is happening is we are combining everything onto the one core now. So when we tried this, so we, we, we definitely faced multiple challenges. So one of that was the soft IRQ. Soft IRQ was causing uh, quite a number of milliseconds in the millisecond the jitter. So soft IRQ was one issue. Uh, Ned, Ned, this IGB driver uh, is was causing another uh, kind of a jitter and then uh, watchdog basically it is connected with the watchdog watchdog issue we had a patch for that and then uh, let us say you have a link you have a network you do net up and down so that is it takes time to restart that was another issue uh, for the adding the jitter and finally the DHCP. So these are kind of our findings uh, while tuning that RT we came across these challenges and uh, I think this is this is what I mentioned here. So real time task, housekeeping, they are running on the same CPU that was a challenge. Uh, software IQ was an, another issue, RCU, net driver was another issue which introduced the jitter and then DHCP. There are some things uh, that we thought okay we can optimize or uh, update that. So. The, pr the proposal is more on like use the hard interrupts instead of the soft IRQs so instead of DHCP the proposal is used more like a static IPs uh, and then uh, some more optimizations around uh, that preempted RT stop some of the services. Uh, again now as everything is running on the one core so do we really need those spin locks and uh, basically the critical blocks correct. So again this is another uh, basically thought to see if we need that one yeah sure. Um. One thing, what is the issue with DHCP? I mean, if you offload everything to one CPU, including RCU, it should not be an issue at all. So we, I think if you see, I do not see if you can see the uh, actual log. So DHCP was definitely adding, uh, adding the jitter. So that, uh, instead of that's why we are saying okay instead of that. But it's a housekeeping CPU, so why do you care? No, so care? now housekeeping is also happening on the same core. So it's yeah. a one core now. So this DSCP is also happening on the one core, correct? So we consolidated the housekeeping and the RT into the one task. So that's why we wanted to basically get rid of the, the dynamic one instead of that. Just go with the static IP. Yeah, but this but you don't. When, one thing I would wonder about is you have a neat reset and this goes for a while until something happens mm -hmm. but this isn't that much it's like 7 micro yeah so yeah this is this is still still in progress so uh, for now we are saying okay instead of dscp because now you have you have housekeeping and the rt running on one core only so dscp was one of the one uh, one of that which was causing the jitter so we the recommendation was okay can we use the uh, the, the static IPs. So just a quick workaround, you disable it for a while. That Yeah, that was a quick workaround to just see if we get the improved uh, jitter. Uh, okay. Yeah. Those are the, for now I think these are the kind of things we uh, uh, modified and I think call call of action. This is one example, I think the, the one word we benchmark, I will just finish this one. This is my last slide. So if whatever the four things that I showed. So if you do not do those optimizations, you will see the jitter around basically 106 microsecond versus when we applied those optimizations. So we have the average maybe like a 20, 22 microsecond. That was kind of uh, uh, the jitter that we observed after tuning. Uh, I'm just a little bit skeptical of the cl claiming or declaring that preempt RT on a single core is something that needs to be fixed or that's something that's not usual. Mm -hmm. Of course, ISO, ISO CPUs is a valid industrial case and I'm not denying that. Mm -hmm. But to claim that preempt RT on a single core is not working or that's like some novel scenario is honestly totally wrong because, because, mo because most, uh, a lot of our customers uh, has single core on preempt RT and it's because a lot of the embedded customers they still use single core to save cost and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's all okay, but just the claim that preempt RT in single core is not compatible is. No, I think I, I never use the word it is not compatible. What I'm saying is the jitter that we expect for our customer is not achievable. That's why we started tuning it. So we are not saying, we are not saying that it is not achievable. That's why we want to do, correct? So what we are saying is 
on the single core, the, the cycle time requirement or the jitter requirement that we have. So what we did on this, this is, we took the Debian uh, and uh, we basically took the minimal Debian image, making sure that we do not keep the other uh, unex unwanted uh, software components. So I, I do not think we are claiming that it is not possible on RTBM, single, single core RTBM. What, what we are saying is, how can we tune it more so I can get the reduced jitter and I can have improved cycle time. It's, it's just because if there is trouble in that case, then that would be actually uh, an, a preemptor debug. So if mm -hmm. there are like really high latency, like 100 microseconds or something, mm -hmm. then this just needs to be traced more and root caused and fixed as an RT bug. So... Yeah. What you're showing is simply what you found, yeah. and, and some of those items in that list, I'm guessing, need to be root caused. I mean, Correct. I was going to ask about soft IRQ. It's not why, a solution. That shouldn't be a problem, yeah. but, it, but it was. But so, so I don't think you're saying that it's not possible. You're saying this is a this, this we, is a, we a, a, a one minute. one attempt at implementation. Yeah. But and and there's lots of things to learn, and yeah. but you, it's, it's totally possible, as he says, right? Yeah. I think you guys are saying the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this was my last slide, and this is where I'm asking. Miss call for help is, I think, if there are BKCs available, I'm happy to basically see, explore, and uh, what we tried was very specific use case for one of our China customer, energy customer. That's what they came up with, and we thought, okay, let's let's work on that. And other options are also possible. Like, I don't need to have RTVMs, single core. I can have containers, and we have those configuration. If you visit eci.intel.com. You will find that multiple configurations we are building. We have the uh, the Docker miss Docker configurations where you have only like just the bare, bare metal OS, and then you run the Docker and they do do a CPU pinning for the containers. I think those were the points that I had. Uh, is the time? Yeah, we have five minutes. If you guys have more questions, you have. Uh, more than a question, maybe, maybe it's something, uh, an approach to try mm -hmm. <clears throat> would be instead of, uh, okay, it's to try. Right? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so instead of trying to make a single core uh, system where you have your real time application and the housekeeping things on the same CPU, mm -hmm. right? Instead of, of trying that, one could try <clears throat> uh, to run. Uh, the two VMs with uh, isolated CPUs, mm -hmm. right? Housekeeping and your, your first case, and then try to pin that uh, the your the CPU where you want you run your workload of two logic. VMs mm -hmm. on, into the same CPU. <clears throat> so because if you have, for example, two 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 workloads that are periodic, for example, uh, ten milliseconds period, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if they run less than fifty percent of the time each one, you can have these two real-time tasks into the same CPU. You just need to shift one from the other. Understood, yeah. And then you could have like two isolated CPUs on the VM, mm -hmm. avoiding all the problems, trying yeah. to avoid all the problems. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, having the hypervisor figuring out run these and run that on different times. As you run, uh, I, I think those small hypervisors, you can have like a timetable of uh, when, each, when each vCPU runs, right? Mm -hmm. So you could run, okay, this, this vCPU runs on the first half of the millisecond, that one runs on the second half of the millisecond, and both CPUs will be isolated. You are basically time slicing that same time, RT. Yeah, uh, time, time is slicing. Two RT onto the one, one yes. they are not using the... Yeah. yeah, and then you avoided the problem of having your housekeeping work on the same CPU of your... <clears throat> and yeah. you still have like a two, CP, two virtual machines into two CPUs, yeah, yeah. just splitting them. Mm -hmm. It's something to try. That you can keep. I have. Oh, yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> um, one thing you could look into it is regarding your watchdog driver. Yeah. Um, we've seen it a few times with different drivers in particular, where the drivers do multiple writes to the hardware, uh -huh. and they get uh, cached by the PCI bus, and then they got flushed at some point when you do a read or something like that. 
and then the latency accumulates because the read forces the CPU to stall, flush all the writes to the hardware, wait for the input, and then the CPU waits for the time. Mm -hmm. So we have this kind of bugs. There is one patch, I don't know, where, so I haven't looked at that, but there is a patch these guys have created. Maybe I'll, you guys have the slides on the website. Uh, there is a, there's a link to the patch. I exactly okay. don't know what was the fix. Again, the way I said correct, I was, I'm not the developer for that specific patch. But they have they have done some work around. But you could encourage your people to um, send patches upstream and maybe they see me if they need um, sure. further input to uh, get the changes upstream for the drivers. Sure. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. I'll talk to you offline. Okay, guys, that was my time. Thank you.